Welcome everyone to the inaugural, is that what we're calling it? The inaugural episode of the Castle of Spirits podcast, the companion to the Castle of Spirits dot com stories website i'll nail down this intro thing as we go i um, am jane and who are you who is this lovely gentleman next to me uh, my name is vince how are you i'm great how are you i'm it's weird to be here because we're doing a podcast for a website that's been around a quarter century mm-hmm. and that we have been fans of for the vast majority of that time since around 2000, 2001 or two. We are the new ghost keepers at the, the Castle of Spirits. A website that dates back, again, like I said, to 1997 mm-hmm. when uh, Rowena Gilbert from Australia began the website. And it changed hands after her unfortunate passing. Mm-hmm. In um, 2008. Right. Yeah. To the groundskeeper, Don, mm-hmm. who... Uh, Did a very good job taking care of the website and keeping it alive Mm -hmm. until... He passed the torch on to us. And we're extremely honored by it. And one of the things I wanted to do with this podcast was not just to talk about the website and that it's there and it's got thousands of ghost stories told by people who submitted their stories, but I thought it would be cool, and you thought it would be cool, Mm -hmm. to read some of the coolest stories on the website. Yes. One of our... Some of our favorites. Yes. And just share them with the audience and uh, maybe have it spark some discussion, maybe get some more people out there to submit their stories, Mm -hmm. true stories of things that have happened to them that went bump in the night. Yes. So like Vince said, we have been fans of the Castle of Spirits for going on 20 years now. Uh, We used to sit in the middle of the night with all the lights off and take turns reading back and forth, reading stories off the website to each other out loud. And uh, we even submitted our own story back in 2002. Man, that was a long time. That was before we... That was 20 years ago this month. That was when we were living in a little tiny one. Well, little tiny. There we go. (laughs) In a small one bedroom apartment mm-hmm. before we moved on to our 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 castle, our grand castle of spirits. We live in the castle now. That's right. We live in the castle. Right. I have always lived in the castle. <laughs> anyway, in my mind anyway. But yeah, it was just uh, you know, it was just us there. We had no cable. Uh mm-hmm. we had internet and the coolest thing we could think to do was to try and freak each other out by reading stories Mm -hmm. in the dark in front of the computer to one another. Of course, we did that when, like, when Art Bell wasn't on or when his episode was... A rerun or... Not exciting. Mike Siegel was sitting in for him before George (laughs) Norrie came along. Yeah. Yo, yeah, we go way back. Way back. Big Art Bell fans. (laughs) And... uh, you know, it just, the whole Castle of Spirits website, it makes me remember those kind of, it was kind of a yeah. golden era back yeah. in the late 90s, early 2000s, when Art Bell was at his peak and, you know, the X-Files was at its peak mm-hmm. and so much was going on with television shows like Sightings. And- well, and for me, like the internet was still fairly new, right? And in, in like 99, 2000. Yeah. And... For people like me who and you who were always into creepy paranormal stuff, it kind of seemed like that was one of the main things that that really took to the internet in the early days. It was so easy to find ghost stories and anything you wanted along the paranormal lines. And it was it was just a really exciting time of kind of discovery. And I think that now sometimes it feels a little saturated. It's not quite as exciting, but the castle still has that kind of excitement for me because it was still so new. And I don't know what I'm saying, but anyway, I'm super excited to be here to be the caretaker of the castle now, the ghost keeper along with you. Yeah. And I share in this excitement. And do you want to... You should see his excited face. He's wearing it right now. I'm just very, very cool and calm because I'm afraid. (laughs) That He's just afraid. There could be period. a leak somewhere in this castle and that we're going to have to fix it. <laughs> oh, yeah. But that's leaky just my roof. own humanly mortal concern. Well, an old haunted castle, it's going to have a leaky roof. So I'll take it. Okay. So 
in this episode, since we're still just kind of feeling it out and figuring out what our format is going to be, and we're aware that that's going to kind of evolve over time, uh, we decided that we wanted to start out by reading. We're each going to read at least one story to you today and kind of find a little bit of conversation that we can have within each of those stories. So we've each picked out a couple of stories Mm -hmm. and we're going to read them to you. These stories are all, all the stories that we're going to read to you are available on the castleofspirits.com website. And uh, all submitted by real people telling their true stories. Yeah. They are as frightening as they are flawed and human. Yeah. And there's, you know, if you want to get a real scare, Listen to a real person telling their story. Yeah. There's a great, I love beautifully written books and terrifying stories of hauntings mm-hmm. that really transport you. But there's nothing as scary as hearing a person say, I looked up and there was a ghost walking <laughs> through the room. I mean, maybe not like that. That's not very scary. But it scared I- me just now. <laughs> But I understand what you're saying. And just in the same way that sometimes these big, huge, you know, big budget movies are nowhere near as scary as creepy little low budget, you know, short films that somebody makes, right? you know, with a camcorder or with their phone or whatever. It's coming from a, a raw source somehow makes it creepier and more real and, and well, closer to closer to home. The Blair Witch Project was one of the scariest things I've ever seen. I know. And as maligned as that movie is these days, you know. I don't understand why. I don't either. But I, yeah, the Blair Witch Project (laughs) was one of the scariest things I'd ever seen. And it didn't show anything. Like, it was all left to your imagination. And well, suffice it to say that it's all about the theater of the mind, and that's what really freaks people out. It's, it's what freaks me out. It's what freaks me out. And, you know, that's... My imagination is scarier than... Anything you could possibly see yeah. or experience. Yeah. I, I wonder what that says about me. But anyway, do you want to read your story first? Do you want me to read first? What do you want? Why don't you go first? All right, Vince. My first story is from May of 2013. And I think you will know exactly why I chose this one. It's called The Crying Woman. Here in Mexico, there's a very well-known legend about a woman who killed her children for love of a man who didn't love her back. The legend says that she drowned the children in a river, and when she found out that the man wouldn't be with her, she committed suicide and her soul still wanders around the rivers in search of her children and people would still hear her crying, Oh, my children. That's why they call her the crying woman. Well, my story is about my own experience with the crying woman. I grew up in a neighborhood next to a river. My mother's sister lived a few blocks away from our house, so I usually go to sleep over my aunt's house with my cousins. One night, we were talking about the crying woman and how my aunt heard her a couple of nights ago. My cousins told me that my aunt was awake late at night when she heard the screams of a woman. She thought someone was in trouble, so she went out of the house searching for her. She thought she was like a block away in the river's direction, so she followed the screaming. When she reached the point where she thought the screaming was coming from, she heard it again, but in the opposite direction, a block away. Then she got scared and went back home. The next day, she acknowledged that some other neighbors heard the screaming too. We were just talking about that when we got scared. I was 13 years old at the time. So we changed the subject and started talking about something else. It was late, and my aunt told us it was time to go to bed, so we turned off the lights and went to bed. We didn't fall asleep immediately. We were still talking and laughing in the dark, when one of my cousins said, Quiet! We stopped talking, and she asked, Did you hear that? I said I didn't hear anything. My other cousin said the same thing. There it is again, she said. The window was open, as it was a warm night of summer. We listened carefully, and we could hear a screaming far away. I mean, like, miles away. We were amazed. Maybe it's the crying woman, I whispered, hoping we could hear it again. We stood there in the dark, expecting maybe another scream in the distance. But then seconds later, we heard a really loud scream just outside the window. 
It was a creepy scream, like a woman's crying of pain. We all screamed our lungs out, and my aunt came running into the bedroom we were staying in, and we told her what had just happened, and she went outside to see if there was someone, but there was nothing. Needless to say, we went to sleep with the lights on and the window closed. A few days later, me and my older sister were home alone since our parents went out for a party. We were watching TV, and I heard the exact screaming far away. I muted the TV and told my sister, who I had already told about my experience at my aunt's house, so we both listened carefully. Then we heard the screaming, but it wasn't as far as I first heard it. My sister was so scared that she turned pale, but she wouldn't admit it. She said, it was probably some drunk girl partying hard or something, but we both knew it wasn't that. It was a painful, long cry. I heard it a few more times after that, and I'm not sure if it was the crying woman, still wandering next to the river searching for her children, or some other spirit. There's people in the neighborhood that say it was a banshee. Only one thing is for sure. It was scary as hell. And that was submitted by Alexa in Mexico. I chose that story specifically because La Llorona is something that has scared the hell out of me my practically my entire life. Yeah. When I was in elementary school in about fourth or fifth grade, I had a couple of friends. They were twins, Raquel and Joel, and they were Great from names. Mexico. They had gone to school in Mexico up until they came to my school and... Raquel was my best friend for those few years in elementary school that we went to the same school together. And she told me first about La Llorona and then spun that tale, I mean, way out, way out to the point where now I'm like, man, she made 90% of what she told me. She made it up because I was eating it up. I had never heard anything so terrifying She's in my watching life. your face and just feeding yeah. off of it. and yeah. Just that story scared me so bad as a kid that even just hearing the name La Llorona would terrify me. And for years, I think you remember events like for years, I wouldn't even say it. I didn't want to hear stories about it. I didn't want you to say it. You know, it was, <laughs> it was so scary to yeah. me and it doesn't have quite the, the, you know, the the terrifying punch to me that it used to being now that I'm very, very old. But <laughs> but I still love that story. And I love to hear stories about it. So that's why I chose that story. The Crying Woman. Thank you, Alexa, for submitting that in 2013. All the way back in 2013. All the way back in 2013. Nice, nice. My story is not from the year 2013. I chose a story. I dug deep. Like I said, this is a, a website that the archives go all the way back to January 1997. My choice was the very first story in the very first month of the very first year that this website was in existence. And it's called A Bed with a Beating. It was about four years ago when this happened to me. I was about 10 at the time, and I'd just gotten bunk beds from some friends of the family. Once I got the bed home, I had my dad place it in the center of the room. I'm not sure why, but that's where I wanted it. One night, about a month later, after I received the bed, someone or something was punching me in my back. Not a friendly tap, but it was as if someone was punching me or throwing a ball at my back. I freaked out and turned to see what was doing it, but there was no one there. After that, I went and slept in the living room. A few nights later, I decided to go back to my bed, and the hitting happened again. But this time, I had a dream. And there was this man in white in it, who had white hair and red glowing eyes, and he was throwing a ball at me, sort of like we were playing tennis. Every time he threw the ball, I missed hitting it, and it would hit me, and I felt as, as if something or someone was right there punching me in the back. I then started hitting the ball back in my dream, and the ball would hit him, and after a while I guess I won the match because the man, if he really was a man, just disappeared. After that, I had no strange experiences while sleeping in that bed, 
but I still had a feeling that he would come back, so I gave the bed back to the people that I got it from. And that's the story. It was submitted by R.M. in Washington, USA, January 1997. Now, aside from the fact that it's so cool that it's su- such an old story, mm-hmm. and it f- starts out saying, it was about four years ago, and I was about 10 at the time. Yeah. So the person telling the story 25 years ago was 14 at the time. Mm-hmm. So by my calculations, that would mean that they're nearly 40 now. Yeah. And I hope that they're... It's weird, a, a website being that old. This website is practically a fossil. Yeah. And I mean, that's the first thing that appealed to me about it. Mm-hmm. The second reason that it appealed to me, I have experienced something like that. Not the dream, not playing a, a game of haunted tennis with a man with white hair in my dreams, but... I'm not somebody who's had a lot of experiences that I can't explain, but one of the experiences that I can't explain. Mm. Is it the pillow? It was the pillow and the mattress. Yeah. There have been a few times in the last, well, I say, you know, in the last 25 years that I can think of where strange things happened to me in bed. Mm -hmm. And now I know that when I hear people say things like this, I think, well, you were well, asleep. You were probably asleep. Yeah. And, but in each of these instances, at the times that these things have happened, you were there with me mm-hmm. and I reported to you what had just happened. Mm-hmm. And of course, that oh. could be something that I just woke up from. But no, one time I witnessed you having the experience and I know that you were awake because I saw you. I saw it happen. And that and, was the pillow. Experience. And so, yeah, the pillow experience. I'll relay that now. Uh, we were lying in bed, you know, going to sleep like no, you, like you. Never do. mind. He's not going to relay it correctly. No, I got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. So we were already sleeping. We were already sleeping. It was the middle of the night. We had already been asleep. I got oh. up in the middle of the night and went to the bathroom. And the bathroom was just off of the bedroom. And as I was coming out of the bathroom, you were sitting up in bed. You had your pillow kind of wrapped in your arms. Your arms were wrapped around your pillow and you were kind of hunching over it. But you were sitting upright and you looked at me. You were awake. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so that's when the pillows... At some point, you arose and it awakened me. And I was hugging the pillow. And as I, as I lay there, I became aware of a tapping sensation that was coming from inside the pillow that mm-hmm. was that I was holding. Mm-hmm. And so I immediately, you know, sat up groggily, still holding the pillow around my stomach. And I was looking down at it like, what is that? I was thinking, is that gas? I mean, can, can stomach <laughs> can gas- Can a pillow have gas? <laughs> no, I was thinking, can stomach gas cause that sound to be happening in my stomach? And it is then- going into the pillow and maybe being amplified by the pillow or, you know, maybe it was some sort of uh, effect where the, the, the the pillow, the density of the pillow was kind of amplifying the sound and giving it a bass quality. Vince Nye, the science guy. (laughs) (laughs) But the thing about it is that in that moment, I was like, there has to be an explanation for this because what is it? It's not me. It's not an animal. Right. And then I thought, what kind of a ghost like goes into your pillow and starts tapping your pillow? So immediately I thought, well, it can't be a ghost either. I don't know what's going on. And that's when you, you came in the room and you're like, what's going on? No, I came oh. into the room and you immediately like threw the pillow right. across the room. You, you came into the room just as I determined that there's something <laughs> wrong with the pillow and I don't want it anymore. And so I'm... I threw it on the floor. And you know what you do? This is the, the mundanity, I guess, the you know, of experiencing something that you can't explain, especially when you're trying to sleep. Mm-hmm. You throw the pillow to the floor and you go lay down, go back to sleep. Yeah. But I know. when And when you're reading these stories so often, you know, they say something like, I heard this thing or I saw this thing or I felt this thing and I just closed my eyes and just tried to go to sleep. And if you've never experienced something like that in that moment, you think, how the hell do you just go to sleep after something right. like that? You can't just pretend that didn't happen and go to sleep. But that's exactly what you do because... Your brain says, there's an explanation, there's an explanation, even though you relay it later and you're like, there's no explanation except 
you know, it's, I'm going to be like the Giorgio Tsoukalos of ghosts. I'm not saying it was ghosts, but it was ghosts, <laughs> you know. But in the moment, it's not. There's so many explanations. You don't know what that explanation is, though. But in a situation like that, though, you know, the reality of the situation is that I had to go to work in the morning. And mm -hmm. there, I was more afraid of not getting a good night's sleep, maybe getting late to work and getting in trouble or something like that, or just doing a, a lousy job at work the next day. I thought you, you can compartmentalize to that yeah. point. You say, I can't, I can't control what's happening at work, what's going to happen at work, but I can control this damn pillow. It's out of here. <laughs> and I, I'm pretty sure that eventually I incorporated it back into the bed because it was a good pillow. But, um, I would, I, you know, ever since then, I, I've wondered what that could have been. And yeah. then I looked at this story and I thought, this is the same, kind of the same thing that happened to me, except for him, it was his mattress. Yeah. And there was something that was punching him in the back. I think my interpretation of the story is that it was punching him in the back through the mattress. Not that there was somebody like mm. lying in bed with him, punching, in the, punching him in the back. Maybe. Or but, maybe it was a haunted bed. I mean, yeah. I would love to know if they ever asked the people that they got the bed from, mm -hmm. like, why did you get rid of this bed? Did anyone else experience something like this with that bed? But also, can I just point out that that is the number one reason you don't put your bed in the middle of the room. <laughs> in the middle of the room, that was right. You have what to have that? your back. You have to be able to face your back to the wall. Because if you're in the middle of the room, ghosts can just circle you. You're just, you're, you're easily circled. They can I, punch you in the back. And, and I'm totally remembering that this terrifying story on Art Bell ages and ages ago mm. about the dude who lived in the woods and, you know, it, it, he was kind of like a, a hermit type and he had uh, what he assumed were the spirits of deceased Native Americans who were keeping him up at night by like, by making these, these sounds. And he got to the point where he had to, he, he could only sleep. He could only keep them at bay with strobe lights. Oh yeah. So he had to sleep at night. I can't night. even imagine. Stro like, yeah. He Sleeping had, with a strobe light. He slept with blinders on and a strobe light, but these things would, when the strobe lights weren't off, they would kind of harass him and attack him. It's a terrifying story. Mm -hmm. Maybe you, somebody sort of, but Speaking of this, uh, this story, a bed with a beating. RM, if you're still out there somewhere, reach out to us. Go to the website because let we us know. have questions. We, I want to know more about this. I want to know if, if you found out whether or not mm -hmm. somebody died in that bed. Now, mm -hmm. I, you know, I slept. I used to sleep in a bed that my grandmother died in. Oh yeah. Um, it's not as creepy as you might think, especially when it's a really cool bed. It's it was a vintage bed with these mahogany. A frame and it was a four poster bed, but the, you know, the mattress had not, it was not a new mattress because th these were so old mm -hmm. that you couldn't just fit a double on there. It was some other weird in between size yeah. from the thirties or whatever. And I, you know, I slept in that bed and I, nothing creepy ever happened, but you know, my grandmother was not a creepy person. Mm -hmm. I mean, not as far as I can remember, mm -hmm. but yeah, you know, I've, I've been in that situation and, um, I, I know that for example, that the pillow that I was using was not probably not haunted because it was from Target. <laughs> so <laughs> I actually so. think it might have been from Shopco. Oh, ooh, that's even worse. <laughs> even maybe, worse. Maybe because Shopco haunted. itself is a ghost now. Is it? It's a ghost town. Was it? And you worked there <laughs> briefly. Was it haunted? Yeah, in like '97. No, the Shopco I worked at wasn't haunted, but uh, one of the women who I worked with was telling me about another shop co that was haunted. And then, of course, we had to start talking about, you know, because we're in a department store. So, of course, then it turned to the haunted Toys R Us. And so Which we were, I've been to. You've been to it? I've been to that haunted Toys. When, when it was open or did you we get were, to, like, go for a ghost hunt type no, thing? No, I went there looking for, for presents for my nephew or my niece. Or and you accidentally bought them a ghost? I wish that I could say that that happened, but um, no, I, I can't say that. No, seriously, though, I went into that place. It was like right next door, Sunnyvale, California. It was right next door to the CD warehouse ah, or right down the street from the it, infamous recall, CD warehouse, um, which is not haunted, but except by wonderful memories mm -hmm. of, of good music. But 
So the Haunted Toys R Us was right there. And I thought, you know, I'm going in. I'm going to go and try and buy this. And at the same time, like kind of strike. Oh, because you knew it was the Haunted Toys R Us. Yeah, I knew it was the Haunted Toys R Us. And I freaked myself out when I was in there. I was down one of these hallways, not hallways, one of these these aisles in the back. And there was like nobody around. Mm -hmm. And I was looking around and for something for somebody, some kid, I don't know. And, um, yeah. And I, you know, when you're in that situation and you're like, and suddenly you're like, this is the haunted Toys R Us. You envision that immediately something's going to fly off a shelf or something's going to tap you or a back. creepy doll is going to start talking to you. Yeah. And the person who works there that. is going to say, that's not a talking doll. <laughs> <laughs> it's a doll that is inhabited by the spirit of a female vampire from your favorite TV series. Okay, we can Oh, the Nadja doll. <laughs> I was looking for the Nadja doll 30 years before I knew it was going to come into existence. Uh, so I think we have time to read another story each. Do you want to read? And it's our first episode. We might as well read two stories and really get the people hooked, you know? Yeah, you got me hooked. All right. Now, why don't you read one? Um, tell us a scary story. Okay, so this next story I'm going to read is from August of 2015. Mm, you're sticking with the current ones. <laughs> I am. And it's because I'm in the middle of, as as of the time that we're recording this, uh, the version of the website that's up is still the old version. And I am working my rear end off to build the new website that you all are seeing at this very moment. And... Part of creating the new website is I have I had to go into every single story on the website and copy and paste it all to a spreadsheet. I had to copy and paste who submitted it, the story itself, the title, all of it into a spreadsheet. I don't know if you should be telling people that thousands our of ghost stories. stories were processed on a spreadsheet. There's nothing <laughs> sexy about or creepy about. Hey, a I beg to differ. I think the spreadsheets are very sexy, and they're not creepy unless. They can You're trying be. to understand anyway. it, you, you know, you lose your sanity in the process. So today, I, Mr. Moon, our black cat, uh, has awakened. So today I'm finishing that process, and so I'm working in the later years. So that's why my stories today are from the later years. This story is from August of 2015, and it's called Weird Cemetery Encounter, and I picked it because I myself have had a weird cemetery encounter or two i recently remembered an unusual encounter my then partner and i had at the local cemetery very odd to say the least about 15 years ago we drove to the cemetery with flowers for my grandparents grave it was late in the afternoon probably about 5 p.m as we drove up the path of that particular section this girl stepped in front of the car from a side path i think not totally sure because we didn't see her at all until she appeared in front of us. She was probably mid-teens, solidly built, with pigtails, but her clothing was that of a much younger child, and old-fashioned. Plaid skirt, cardigan, and jumper like I wore as a child in the 60s. We were going slowly, and she started twirling and dancing just a few feet in front of us as we continued up the path, and in her arms was a bundle of cuddly toy animals. Straight away, I got a weird feeling about this girl. My partner could see her, too. He was getting annoyed because she wouldn't move out of the way. Finally, we stopped. I stepped out of the car, and she was gone, just like that. I stood there dumbfounded. The cemetery was quite flat, and you could see all the way over. No sign of her. While I tended to my grandparents' grave, my equally puzzled partner went for a walk to see if she might have been hiding, but nothing. She had just vanished. It was the oddest thing. Nothing made sense. Her dress, her behavior, even the cuddly toys. I still remember her very clearly. I can still see her twirling and dancing with this odd little smile, and I have no explanation all these years later. And that was submitted by Anonymous in South Australia. Okay, that's one of the creepiest things I've I know. ever. You know, I, I have to. I can. I can tell you that I saw something like that once, but mm. it, it had a more, more of a, 
an earthly explanation. Well, I think that sometimes, not all the time, and I'm not suggesting this one does, but I think that a lot of times they do. But that doesn't, that shouldn't detract from their creepy factor. Well, the the location is the clincher of the whole thing. Yeah, it can be. But it so is, tell me yours, and then I'll I'll tell you. Well, you know, I was just, during my mismet, misspent youth, I was sitting in the car one night listening. Your to misplaced the, childhood. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was sitting in the car with a friend of mine. We were listening to the radio or listening to music or something, and mm-hmm. we we're just sitting out in front of my house. Were you listening to the album Misplaced Childhood? I was not listening. We were we were probably listening to prog rock, okay. but not that. Okay, maybe old Genesis. And we look up. I don't know which one of it. Who who said it first? Uh, do you see that? And like down the end of the street. It's a cul-de-sac, and we're facing the end of the cul-de-sac. Oh, yeah, I remember this story. There is, you know, a driveway that's facing us, it's, and it's like midnight, and there's a girl, and she's dancing in the driveway. Mm-hmm. And we were like, I said, the, just the question you normally ask, you say, do you see that? Mm-hmm. And, yeah, is she dancing? What is she doing? I think she was just a girl who was practicing, but that was it. You know, I mean, we just, we saw that it was, it it was ethereal and Mm -hmm. it was fascinating. And Mm -hmm. we turned off the music and we just sat there and watched her. Mm -hmm. Which sounds creepy, but I, yeah, but we were perfectly innocent about it. Yeah, of course. And eventually she, she either finished and went back inside or, you know, my friend said, I gotta go. Mm -hmm. And we split and he split. And I don't think we ever saw it again. Mm-hmm. But it never quite left me. That was not not creepy, though. Mm-hmm. If I saw that at night in a cemetery, I'd probably be doubly creeped out. Mm-hmm. But that was my experience. Yeah. So one time, the, this was my creepy uh, cemetery encounter. Um, when I was in junior high, we lived near a cemetery. Not a particularly old or creepy cemetery. It was kind of small kind of flat, or it's very, very flat. Not a lot of stand-up graves. There were some, but anyway, it's it's just one of those cemeteries that you can see everything. Mm-hmm. There were some trees and some bushes, and today, if you go to that cemetery, there aren't. They've taken them all out. No trees, no bushes. It's even flatter. But this time, there were bushes, and it was night, and I was just out and about with some friends. I was probably in, I think it was in eighth grade. Maybe. So might have been the summer between eighth and ninth grade. Eighth and ninth grade. You're raising heck. Not he- quite hell. Raising lots of heck. Yeah. And in Utah, when you're in eighth and ninth grade, raising heck is about as dramatic as it gets. Oh, wow. So we were like, well, let's go hang out at the cemetery. Not to do anything, you know, just to hang out. And it was late, and so we didn't want to get, like, busted by the cops or whatever. There was this big bush, and we it was big enough that it kind of hung over. And there were about five of us, I think. And so we went under the bush, and we were able to just kind of sit there in this little circle of friends just sitting there chatting under this big bush. And the cemetery was fairly well lit. There were you know, street lights because it's in the middle of a neighborhood. So there were street lights and there weren't really any dark corners to hide in the cemetery. So we're sitting there and we're just chatting. And the bush we're under is on the the far north end of the cemetery. And the far south end of the cemetery, there were houses just on the other side of it. And that whole side was fully lit by street lights. And we're sitting there chatting and we glance over at the south end and we see this person walk into the cemetery and they're wearing like a hoodie and the hood is pulled up and they have their hands in their pockets and, but it looks like they're, they're looking straight ahead. Like they're not looking around. They're not looking down at the ground like you know, if you go into a cemetery, a lot of times you, you, you're you looking at the ground. You don't want to trip on things or you're looking at the tombstones or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. But this person, it looked like they were just, that their head was just straight forward. 
and they were very upright. Their hands were just jammed in their pockets and they entered the cemetery and they'd kind of weave through a little bit, like walk a little bit and then stop. But again, they weren't looking anywhere, just straight ahead. And then they'd stand there still for a few minutes or a minute, which is a long time when you're just sitting there staring at someone, you know, and then they would just start walking through and weaving through again and stop and just hold still for a minute or two. And then they did that again. They turned around and they would do it again until they were back out of the cemetery. And it was just, it was just really creepy. And I guess, you know, it could have been somebody just out for a walk, but that was just a very solid <laughs> way to walk into a cemetery and not very mechanical, around. like and very, very mechanical, very rigid yeah, and, and, and really and not not really human like, right? And now the way that they were going through and like weaving and stopping and weaving and stopping, I could see like if somebody was smoking a cigarette or if they're on a phone call. But back then, this was the mid '90s. We didn't have cell phones. So they, you know, and their arms weren't up. They weren't on the phone. They weren't hand to mouth. They weren't smoking a cigarette. They, hands in their pockets. They were very mechanical, very rigid. And it was creepy. And that has always stuck with me. But no, no, like I said, they came out of a neighborhood and they ended up turning around and going right back into the neighborhood. So the probability that it was just some guy doing something from the neighborhood very very high i'm not suggesting it was a ghost but it was weird as hell and it was <laughs> the middle of the night in a cemetery and uh we immediately were like you know maybe it's time to go home <laughs> could it be that they were looking for you no they weren't looking for anything it was i can't stress that enough they weren't looking around when they stopped when they stopped walking, they, their head didn't turn. Mm. They weren't looking side to side. They didn't like turn around to look behind them. They weren't looking at the ground or up at the sky. Or, they were they were just solid, just straight up and down, head forward. They weren't looking for anything. Okay. Occam's razor. Occam's razor. Occam's razor. Big it fan. Was, it was a neighbor. Mm-hmm. Wearing a neck brace because they they were in traction or they 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 they'd been in an accident or the, something like that. Yeah, just taking it in. They were and they were getting their the night. they were getting their steps in because it was like oh it's midnight and I didn't get my steps in. We I'm didn't have step get... counters back then. Well, they could have been counting out loud. They weren't exercising. They were leisurely strolling for a second. Leisurely stroll. Stop. But I still stand by the the neck brace theory. Okay. Because if they had a hoodie, on, if you have a neck brace, you kind of embarrassed by it. I guess I don't. I've never had to wear one. You know. Hopefully, I never will. And you put your hoodie up, <laughs> and then it, you just look like you're, you know, Mister Roboto. Or I mean, something. it's the middle of the night, but still. But that's a good point because they did have a hoodie on, and like I've seen you do because Vince likes to wear his hoodie in the house. He'll have the hoodie pulled up, but. A lot of times when, when you're cold. when you're wearing a hoodie, you can turn your head inside of the hoodie without it like moving the whole hood, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. You can kind of turn your head within it. So it is possible that they were walking around and looking around, but from where we were sitting and the angle of the light, it it looked like they weren't looking around at all. And that cemetery, like I said, is very small. It's about a a half of a neighborhood block. It's not very big. It was an experience nonetheless. It was. And something that stuck with. It Just was. like the dancing girl in the, mm -hmm. you know, in the cul-de-sac. Mm -hmm. There was nothing mystical about that, but it was something yeah. kind of beautiful. And, you know, I never knew who that person was. But, um, yeah, it's an interesting story. Yeah. Thank you for sharing it. Thank you for sharing. Do you want to read your second story? Okay, for my choice of story... I went to the part of the website, castleofspirits.com, mm -hmm. labeled Spookiest Stories. Ah, uh, yes. This is where, over the years, some of the best stories that readers of the website have submitted have been grouped together. It's sort of a greatest hits of all the thousands of, of submissions. You better not be reading the story that I think you're reading. No, and this story that I picked. What's that, y'all? No. no. <laughs> hmm. 
And I picked a story called Racing the Devil. Ooh. Now, it's just a story that speaks for itself, so I'm going to go ahead and read it now. My story begins on an April night, about 3 a.m. I was driving home from my girlfriend's house. She lives in Parma, Ohio, and I live in Macedonia, Ohio, about a half an hour away. I was driving down Canal Road, a road that runs along a canal, what a surprise, that was used a long time ago to ship goods between Akron and Cleveland. Canal Road is a fairly busy road during the day, but at this early hour, I was the only car on it. The road also doesn't have any street lights, so it's quite dark, and being in a low-lying area, there's always a little fog. I was driving along with my high beams on when I saw a man walking along the canal side of the road. As I got closer, he turned and looked at my car, and I caught a look at him in the headlights. Something about him just didn't seem right. He had a very strange look on his face. I can't really explain it any better. Just strange. I drove past him, a little shook up. I'm a pretty big guy, and I don't intimidate easily, but something about this face really creeped me out. About a half mile or so down the road, I got a strange feeling. I looked to my left, and just in the glow of my headlights, I saw the man I had passed a while back running alongside my car. I thought I had to be seeing things. I was doing about 45 miles an hour, but the man ran just slightly ahead of my car. I could see quite clearly that it was him, except that his face... His head was turned toward me, and he was looking right at me. His face was different, more twisted and evil-looking. I hit the gas and sped up to about 55 or 60, and he kept up with me the whole time. By this time, I was beyond scared. I was terrified. I pressed on the gas, but I had come to a hill, and my old car doesn't like hills too much, so I didn't pick up much more speed, maybe another mile per hour or two. Just as I was coming to a bend in the road, another car was coming the other way. It flashed its lights at me. I still had mine on. And I stopped looking at the man for a second or two. When I looked back, he was gone. I looked in the rearview mirror, but all I could see was the taillights of the other car disappearing around the bend. I didn't slow down until I got to the intersection not far from my house. To this day, I have no idea what this man was. The evil expression on his face still haunts me to this day. He reminded me very much of the pictures of the devil that you see in those old paintings and such from the Renaissance. Very dark and ominous. I told a couple of people of that night, but as expected, not one of them ever believed me. I've also since read about similar sightings from all over the country. Some people claim it's everything from ghosts to the devil to alien visitors, but I just don't know. I still drive that stretch of road occasionally and had never seen anything else quite that strange. But believe me, I always keep a lookout. That was submitted by Anonymous in Ohio, USA. That was scary. That was really scary. And, you know, I I read that story because I have a great love for, I mean, I don't think there's anything quite as terrifying as driving at night. Mm -hmm. In the middle of the night, alone Mm -hmm. on a road nothing quite as terrifying and nothing as cool either Mm -hmm. and those are the settings that that i just i kind of gravitate to well of course you would like that it has a very carnival of soul vibe carnival of souls carnival of souls vibe and it's got a you know again a very art bellian vibe you know Mm -hmm. what do you listen to when you're driving in the middle of the night it better be art bell in the middle of nowhere i mean i I realized man is dead but well, his archives will live on. They will live on. If and if you don't have a few on your thumb drive in the car, then <laughs> then, then you're crazy. Then are you even a, an Arbel fan? That was my story. That and was great. I I remember when I used to live in San Jose, the San mm-hmm. Jose area, commuting a lot between Morgan Hill and San Jose and Santa Clara and stuff like that. I would drive a stretch of the 101, the old 101, called Blood Alley. Called Blood Alley. Mm-hmm. I think it was one of the first times that you and I met. The first time you and I met, you came yeah. out to visit me in California. Long story. And I took you. For our first date, he took me to get Jack in the Box and then drove me down Blood Alley at midnight, looking at me going, huh? While listening to huh? an old 1997 or 1999 
Art Bell, yeah. Ghost to Ghost, talking about that very stretch. And of I was just like, oh, yeah, wow. Okay, my Jack in the Box is getting cold. No, it was Wendy's. It wasn't. It was Jack in the Box. because. Okay. Well, let's not talk about food. Because we don't have Jack in the Box here. And as soon as I got to California, I was like, Mama needs some Jack in the Box. Okay. Anyway. Anyway, that story freaked me out when I read it. Yeah, that's a great story. And, and the uh, description of the face as a as the face turns and looks at him while he's driving, while it's running ahead of him. Oh, was, yeah. That, that aspect really of scary. it, too, also reminds me, uh, my best friend Glenn, his, uh, his family, they're Guamanian, mm -hmm. Chamorro. And he relayed a really creepy story. Oh, the, yeah. The, in, in Guam, they have this these fables, not fables. Legends. These, yeah, these le the legend of the Tatamona. Mm -hmm. I believe. Yeah, the Tatamona. I'm not sure I'm spelling, I'm pronouncing it right, but I'm spelling it correctly in my face, in my brain. But um, In my face. <laughs> in my face. <laughs> and Glenn told me the story that was relayed to him by his grandfather, that he, you know, his grandfather was uh, getting on the, uh, on the freeway or the highway out there. Mm. And there was a little boy on the side of the road looking at him. And he he took off and you know, he went onto, onto the entry ramp and he looked over and the little boy was running alongside the car. Oh, no. And as he sped up to f highway speeds, the boy was still following along mm -mm. and looking right at him nope. with this sort of curious expression on his face. That may have been a story that grandpa told to his grandchildren just to freak him out or mm -hmm. to maybe to give him something, a, lo a little bit of a connection between where they're from, mm -hmm. you know, having been raised on the mainland in the States and having been disconnected from that culture. Mm -hmm. It's a very rich culture and apparently a lot of really creepy stories. But, you know, maybe it was something he actually saw. Mm -hmm. We don't know. I mean, there's, it's, they're legends for a reason. It's yeah. because, it's not, it's not because one man saw a little boy running alongside a car. Yeah. It was because a lot of people have seen a lot of creepy stuff. So you bring me to an uh, a point where I wanted to, you reminded me to say something. <laughs> Good. Uh, everybody, I mean, ov obviously all of us around the world live in different places, whether it's a different country or a different state or even just a different state of mind, town or neighborhood. Oh. And all of these locations that we live in all have their own legends whether they're a well-known legend or just you know the neighborhood kids talk about the haunted house at the end of the block or whatever it is and we haven't all necessarily had experiences with our local legends even though we may know about them so what I am getting at here is that I want to hear about your local legends. Like, what is a legend where you're from, where you live? Like I said, it, it could be, you know, local to your country, local to your state, local to your neighborhood. What is the local legend, whether you've had experience with it or not? And I just want to know everything about that. So you can email us or message us on the Castle of Spirits website, feel free to submit that and maybe we'll, we'll read it on our next podcast. This is also new to us. Maybe we'll create a local legends section on the website where people can go and read them as well. Right. Because one of the things that we talked about was that we love ghost stories, mm -hmm. but there's so much more to love that is not ghost stories, mm -hmm. but that it's a big castle. And it's, it's a, a castle, huge castle. Just because it's a castle of spirits doesn't mean that that's all that lives in there. Right. And um, we have outbuildings. We there's do. The, there's the greenhouse. We also have a very large, uh, large guest rooms in the house. One is there's the time slip, rooms. the time yeah. slip room. Another one is the. Do we are we going to do an ancient aliens room? No, I, I'm sure maybe, that we can find room aliens. for the to house the aliens. But, you know, like I said, the greenhouse outside is where our cryptozoologicals are. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we've got room for the So we've got room for the cryptids. We've got a room for the aliens. We've got a room for the urban legends, for the local legends, for the... Yeah, there's there's the time slip closet. Yeah. Um, you walk into that closet and you come out in a completely different time and place. We've got, we've got room... 
for all of the things. If it's paranormal. And if it's freaky, we want to hear about it. It lives at the castle. And all welcome. <laughs> a beautiful way to end this. <laughs> I feel like Craig T. Nelson, only half as tall and twice as bald. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully you're not eating a raw steak. No, that wasn't Craig T. Nelson. That um, was the... Uh, oh, that was the guy peeling his face off in the bathroom. That was one of the guys that was there in the house in the movie that had maybe one line mm-hmm. that was there with... Uh, um, Zelda Rubenstein. Zel- what was Zelda's character's name? I don't remember. Now I have to find out. But when I was a kid, Poltergeist scared the hell out of me. And the whole, like, the scene with the steak really stuck out. At me, and uh, of course, the scene where he's tearing his face off in the bathroom mirror really scared me. And of course, the clown. I mean, we haven't even touched on my clown thing yet. I'm sure we'll get to it. Tangina Barons. Anyway, okay, the moment has passed. Zelda's a better name. Zelda is. Yeah. So that's all for this episode. It's our very first episode. So please feel free to. Uh, message us on the website there's a little contact box Um, as of recording this I don't know what the URL is because it doesn't exist yet but just poke around on the website and you'll find it and in future episodes I will make sure to say what that URL is because I'll know but poke around on the website until you figure out how to contact us and send us your stories send us any kind of paranormal story you like We'll find a place for it. Like I said, all are welcome. And Vince, do you have anything else to add before we wrap this beast up? No, other than this was really fun and I want to do it again. And I hope that uh, you guys will listen and Mm -hmm. help us out by submitting your stories, your true ghost stories. And share it with a friend because the more stories we can get submitted to us, the more reading there is for all of us each month and the more enjoyment we can bring to paranormal lovers all over the world. All right, so stay scared. And, oh. oh, I like that. What? Stay scared. So st- stay scared, my friends. <laughs> <laughs>